if it ever did. <laughs> so, uh, firstly, let me thank the, the organizer as the other invitee, and especially Fabio for all the work that he did. Um, just as an appetizer, I give you two quotes, and I won't comment on them, but uh, this is the larger scope of my talk, just to understand what, what's happening between these two quotes. Okay. Um, so, my uh, talk will have uh, a lot of connection with what Bernard Lowe's, uh presented as regards the question of the certitude in but I would like to uh, complete the pictures that uh, Bernardo's gave uh, outside of its immediate context. That is to say, what he presented, that is to say, the tension between an Aristotelian standard of science and the Euclidean form of, uh, of science. And in particular, I don't think that change, uh, things will change a lot with Descartes and Leibniz. Right? So even if you are outside of an Aristotelian context, you still have problem with the certainty of mathematics. And the deep reason is that it's not clear that mathematics are certain. And so that would be the two, the two uh, part of my, of my talk to try to explain that. Do you, do you know who is Maurice de Nassau? So Maurice de Nassau was a prince in, um, in Holland. And when he died, he, he called two, uh, two priests. And, uh, and he said that he was not happy with the uh, answer, and they said, I, I see only one thing, which is the, the fact that mathematics are certain. And this anecdote is very famous because it was taken over by Molière in Don Juan as the declaration of atheism. And, and what is behind it, I said, I said I would not comment on it, so take this out of my time, it was a question. But uh, what is interesting is that at that time, the certainty of mathematics was so widespread that it was in, in a theater piece, in theater play. And, and that's. Yeah. And when he invaded Brazil, it's he was the same. Brazil. Oh, okay. I don't think he it's the same movie as the Nassau. We have to check. There were several movies in Nassau. Yeah, but probably the same one. He was a prince oh, yeah. and lived in Brazil. And, uh, maybe, so that would be a, a, a beautiful connection. Uh, anyway, so let me let me just talk about the, the first motivation of my book. So this question, why, when and why did mathematics start to be static? In fact, uh, I... Uh, I, uh, this is a question that I was asked, and I did not know how to answer. And I was asked by uh, an historian of Greek mathematics named uh, Bernard Vitral, who works with a French translator of Euclid. And uh, his own motivation, maybe I forget a little bit. Can you hear me? Is it fine? Because it's uh, over last time. I believe that you put that one. No, no. No, I think it's fine. That's fine. I think I, think I can. So his own motivation was he was working on Ptolemaeus. And in Ptolemaeus, there is a famous passage in the preface. No, that's okay. I think they can. And there is a famous passage in, in, in the preface of the Almagest, in which, in which Ptolemaeus says that mathematics are un, undisputable. Undisputable. And so Wittrak uh, knew that I was working on a philosopher of mathematics, philosophy of mathematics in antiquity. And he wanted to know, that was the question, if it was a standard <coughs> description of mathematics. So he looked in his books, in Plato, in Aristotle, and he discovered that it was not. So he asked me, <coughs> do you know other people saying that mathematics are undisputable? All right? So you can translate if you want by certain. All right? And uh, I looked and I didn't find much. So that was, that was quite a surprise. So, uh, 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 for example, uh, 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 Proclus says that uh, uh, mathematical propositions are anelecta, which is not the same word. Anelecta means that it's not subject to elenchos, to the dispute. All right? But he says that always in passing. He says that rarely and always in passing. So that's quite, that's quite surprising. And when, when people like Proclus or Plato or Aristotle wants to talk about mathematics, the first thing that they do is that they talk about their object. And if they say that mathematics has something special as regards the stability of his proposition, that has nothing to do with certainty, that has to do with the type of object that they are talking about. So uh, uh, that, was, that was quite uh, intriguing. Moreover, when, when one reads Ptolemaeus or Proclus, who are huge supporters of mathematics, one sees that they were forced to defend the indisputability of mathematics, not only against Epicurean and Stoic, but also against Aristotelian and Platonist. 
there is a huge passage in Proclus in which he says, people in my house, don't forget that Proclus was the head of the academy in Athens, said people in my house criticize mathematics because of the first quote that I gave, where Platymatics, uh, where Glaucon in the Republic says, I know hardly one mathematician able of reason. So this is uh, uh, quite important, and if you read this quote from Ptolemaeus, you see that, in fact, what he is doing is that he's reversing a Platonic schema by saying that theology, which was considered as one of the first science, um, is something like an acacia, a guesswork. And this is the word used by Plato to characterize the lowest kind of knowledge. But if you remember the line in the Republic, mathematics hold the same position to Nous uh, than acacia to pistis. And when you read the description of mathematical objects, mathematical objects are an image of ideas. And they are criticized because they are hypothetical. And this is important to say because we have the tendency to call Platonist somebody who believes in objects which are ideals. So we can, but this is not Plato's position. Mathematical objects are image of ideal entities. And this is quite important. Um, and uh, this is something also that I want to insist on because part of my talk will be try to try to show that when we look at the mathematical Greek practice, there is something quite deep about the fact that objects are hypothetical. So, in a way, uh, it should not have been a surprise uh, uh, that uh, uh, I could not find many uh, uh, many quotes about the certainty of mathematics in the Greek in the Greeks in the Greek philosopher. Because it, uh, it, uh, it was in agreement with many facts which I came across and which I could not always match together. And suddenly it was like a key to understand several things that I, I, I saw before and that I, I understood better. First of all, when I, when, I, when I was doing my philosophy class, I learned that Descartes was responsible for introducing in the history of philosophy the centrality of the certainty. If this is often presented as a, a kind of revolution, so this is one of the most famous quotes, this is in the rules for the reaction of the mind, we should concern ourselves only with those objects of which our minds appear to, to be adequate in gaining their certain and indubitable, indubitable knowledge. All science is certain and evident knowledge. He who doubts of many things is not what learned that who, he who know, has never thought about them. And the consequence of this is that the, uh, when we, we look at science, uh, in science, there is scarcely one question in science on which clever people have not often disagreed, and there is only one exception, mathematics. Okay? So I knew that. I knew that Descartes invented this position, and it was a new criteria uh, uh, for truth. For... And um, I knew also that thanks to this uh, position, Descartes was able to recast knowledge on two foot, intuition, and inferences. And this is what he says here, you can read, this is the follow, the, what, is, what follows in the rules. He says, because we want a, a, a certain science, we have only two main tools, which is to, have to base everything on intuitive knowledge and inferences taken from intuitive knowledge. So this is often presented as uh, something like a revenge of Platonism against Aristotelianism, this model of mathematics, but if you remember what I said before, th th this is not at all clear. This is not at all clear. And we know now, thanks to works of historians, that things are much less simpler than people from the end of the 19th century, we talk about Husserl, but we can also talk about Cassirer, and, and still of Coiré. Things are much less simpler than what they thought, because the debate between Platonism and Aristotelianism was inside of the scholastic, the late scholastic. And this is what we show, what we saw is uh, what, uh, or this is another claim very famous by Descartes, but I will skip this one. So this is what we saw with, uh, with the, the work on the question of the certitude in it that uh, Bernardo's uh, mentioned. There, there is a, a long work, uh, an historiographical tradition. I just put the first one and in the etc. cetera, et cetera. I have Bernardo, Bernardo's PhD thesis and uh, Fabio's paper on the certitude of two. So uh, there is a huge tradition which shows that, in fact, the, de the debate between Platonism and Aristotelism, and typically the debate between Platonism and Aristotelism in Galileo, inherited directly from the scholastic 
and not from a rupture from the uh, philosophy of the school. This is very well uh, indicated by Anna de Pache in his, uh, in his uh, uh, seminal work on, on, on this question. So we saw, uh, I, I won't come back on the, on the question of the Saturday dinner because Bernardo has presented the, the technicality which are behind it. But something which is very striking that I want, I want to emphasize is the role of Proclus. So as Bernardo has recalled, uh, the question of the Saturday dinner existed <coughs> in late Middle Ages. But still, there was a revival in 16th century. Why? It's very clear that the source of this revival is the, uh, is the publication, the first publication of Proclus. So we keep in mind that Proclus was not known before that time. It was not known in Arabic. It was not known in Latin. Some manuscripts were circulating, but they were very rare. And so Proclus is edited only for the first time at the beginning of the 16th century. Not only that, it edited in the Editio Princeps of, of Euclid. So everybody who wants to have the Editio Princeps of Euclid has, at the same time, Proclus with it. It's very important. And when you look at Piccolomini, this is the same page that Bernardo showed, except that I could not have the M. I don't know why. <laughs> so anyway, here what, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Piccolomini says is that when I was young, when I learned uh, uh, philosophy at school, they told me that mathematics was the most certain of all science. So, this is in school, in an Aristotelian setting, because this is Averroism, all right? And I, I was quite depressed because when I looked at mathematics, I did not find that the most certain of all science. But what a relief when I discovered Proclus, I had an authority who showed that. <coughs> who showed that mathematics is not certain. First time I read this passage, I thought this piccolomini is crazy. How could you think that Proclus is against the certainty of mathematics. Proclus is the head of Pato School, is the, 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 the most enthusiastic supporter of the role of mathematics. And so I thought that there was some kind of a misunderstanding. And I, I even wrote that in a paper. And now I think that this is not a misunderstanding at all. This is just what, uh, what uh, uh, Bernardo has explained. This is the discrepancy between two types, two ways of thinking which don't match together. Ancient Greek mathematics and their own criteria for certainty. But if it is the case, the point is that, in fact, Piccolomini is right. That is to say that if you get rid of all the technicality of the question, when you read Proclus, you have a strange feeling that mathematics is not certain. Okay. This is, this is my, my main point. Okay. So uh, this is what I want to show to you in the uh, uh, next uh, part of the of the, of the talk, I want to show to you that when you read Proclus, if you think that mathematics is certain, you have to, well, you have to build uh, a new definition of what certainty is. All right? Okay? So that's, that's exactly the type of problem that they will have. And, and then the other problem, the other thing that I would like to, to show and that will connect with what the Folkers has uh, presented this morning is that this instability is still present in Descartes and Leibniz. They didn't get rid of it at all. Although they say what they say uh, before. So uh, first, uh, first of all, let, let us look at the evidence that Proclus gives us on Greek mathematical practice. And what appears at first sight is that this indisputable science was full of disputes. Everyone. <laughs> Everywhere, everything is disputed. When you read Proclus, there are zillions of objections. Among these debates, I look at the time, okay, I will go very fast on, on that aspect, but there are, there are objections that you can decide to leave out. For example, philosophical discussion. You can say, okay, this is philosophy, but this is not inside of the mathematical practice because when I read a clip, when I read Archimedes, Archimedes, I don't see this debate. So there are a, a, a long series of objections that you can, okay, maybe, Put aside. So uh, I, I describe all of this uh, uh, because some of them are quite interesting, like the, the question of simplicity in the curve and so on. And, and it's not so clear that they are purely philosophical. But let's say we get rid of all of this. Even if you get rid of all of this, there are still a huge amount of objections that were made by mathematicians, by profession, and that Proclus even ascribed to books, mathematical books, that are not all discussion. He says in this book, Apollonius is disagree with Euclid and so on. Right. And these are not small mathematicians. Right? These are not. 
So uh, uh, I will. I, I have selected a, a few examples. So the first example is precisely the Apollonius. Okay. So maybe Proclus is not uh, saying the truth. Maybe he has distorted evidence. But this is not the problem. The problem is that if you are Greek in the fifth century, you can you can read this and find it credible. All right. So maybe Apollonius did not say that. Maybe he did not write that. We don't know. We have no way to know since we don't have this. Book. So this is very interesting because one thing that was hugely debated is common notion. That is the thing which is presented as being completely undisputable, self-evident, self-evident. Right? This is presented and this is what Proclus remind in the Aristotelian vocabulary. These are self -evident, these are truths that are not disputable. And still there were disputes about that, and typically Apollonius disagreed with all of Euclidean common notion. Why? Because he thought that there were empirical facts and not, and I don't, and they could be demonstrated on the way that space worked. So he tried to demonstrate that the, the axioms for equality can be demonstrated from the, uh, the, the, the functioning of congruence. All right? And then Proclus replied, no, you can't do this because congruence implies equality, and so this is interesting. All right? This is the first type of example, just to show to you that. They even debate on what was the most undebatable thing, common notion in UK. All right? And this is Apollonius. This is not a small mathematician. And now I will give you a, a completely different series of examples. This is an objection to 1 1, which was raised by a guy named Zenon. Zenon. This is not the Zenon the city. Okay, this one was epical. And the objection is that when I, when I uh, uh, construct my equilateral uh, triangle, I, I don't know if my two lines will intersect only in one point. So this is interesting because you know that Pash and Gilbert said, oh, this is the problem. They did not see that. They saw that. They saw that. They discussed about that. Okay? Not exactly in the same way that Pash and Gilbert. This is not the same problem. Their problem is that how do you know that these two lines don't have a common segment? You have to prove this. Okay? So this is one type of objection. What I want to do, what I ask you is to look at the diagram. Okay? It's a very strange diagram. So these are these are two straight lines, right? Okay. Okay. And this is an admissible objection. Second example. This is a passage in which Proclus discusses the fact that Euclid forgot to demonstrate that two lines can't enclose a space. And he says, okay, let's suppose that two lines enclose a space, and they derive a contradiction. So these are two straight lines, which enclose a space. All right. Look at the diagram. All right. And this is an ardent supporter of Euclid, and uh, 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 he knows very well mathematics. Okay, this is a, a, a another example. I have, I have zillion of examples like that, but I give you just a few examples. So Euclid forgot to demonstrate that when a line cuts a circle, it cuts it in two points. It may be the case that it cuts a line in three points. So this is a circle. As you can see, and it cuts in three points. All right? So when you see that, <laughs> you see that there were first a lot of debate in uh, Greek mathematics and strange debates. Strange debates because if I can draw whatever I want and, and, and make an objection, I mean, the first reaction that we would have is to say this diagram is not admissible. Okay. And for example, the Vilnets argue that the only thing that you need. In the Euclidean geometry, is that the lines are straight. So, if it were the case, you could get rid of this diagram. But in fact, there is a good reason why you can't get rid of this diagram. It's because you use them <laughs> when you do Euclidean geometry. If you want to do a reduction by absurdum, by definition, you need to, to draw an impossible diagram. And the only way to draw a, a lines which intersect where they do not, and so on, is exactly to use. So, these are straight lines. Famous proposition. 127. So this is the same. A broken line is a straight line. It's the same problem. And this is a uh, tree two. So this is a straight line, which falls out of the circle in, instead of falling inside. All right. In the two cases, I have put uh, the, the modern diagram because these are we are very lucky in this case. There are no discrepancy between all the diagrams that exist. Sometimes there are discrepancies. You have to be careful. Okay. So I've checked. So what I want to show to you is that there were huge debates on many aspects, including the most uh, uh, 
undebatable one, like common notion. But these debates occur with, with something which is deeply linked with the hypothetical nature of mathematical objects. That is to say that when I look at an object, and this is connected to what, to what Marco is saying uh, today about construction, if I don't have the construction, if I just give you a diagram, I have no way to know if this diagram is admissible or not. I have to check. And in fact, by preparing this talk, I realized something which was uh, quite surprising is that uh, Proclus, when he described the famous passage about the different uh, part of the of the proposition, you know, that uh, he explained all the steps in the demonstration and so on. And he also give a definition of what is a porism, what is a lemma, and so forth and so on. And there is a category, nobody talked about it, objection. And I will read it to you because you will see that in fighting <coughs> geometry you can make whatever objection you want and you don't need to prove it. I will read it. All right? An objection, so the, 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 the word is it's the technical word, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's written in a special form, prevents an argument from proceeding on its way by opposing either the construction or the demonstration. Unlike the proposer of a case who has to show that the proposition is true of it, he who makes an objection does not need to prove anything. Rather, it is necessary for his opponent to refute the objection and show that he who uses he who uses it, it's in, it, it, in its error. All right? So this is very intriguing. That is that when you look at Proclus and when you see what he tells us about the Greek mathematical life, it was full of dispute. You can make whatever objection you want, and you don't need to prove it. It's the, method, the other one who has to refute uh, 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 what, what you're saying. All right? So this is the first thing that I wanted to show to you. The second thing that, uh, uh, so now what we have <laughs> is, uh, okay, so how is it that they say that mathematical proposition, sometimes they say that it's irrefutable or undisputable, I give you some. Or is it that the same Proclus said that they are undisputable? All right, so I will give you, I will try to give you an answer at the end of the talk. But before this, I, I just wanted to show to you that this problem is a huge problem that Piccolini sees immediately. I mean, when you build Proclus, you access to something which is in complete discrepancy that when you, when you access, when you just heard about what is supposed to be mathematics, it's cool. Okay? You see the life of mathematics, you see the debate, you see all of this. And this was the first time that they saw that. So it's no surprise that there was a huge revival on the question of the certitude in at that time and, and why it, it was a huge insanity. Now I want to show to you that in fact, in Descartes and Leibniz, there is not a huge change as regards the type of criteria that we can uh, uh, bring uh, to answer this question. So, but I will go very fast because I see time running. So I, I just want to go to, to uh, rule two. So I said that mathematics, so we need to have a certain science based on intuition and deduction, and mathematics is the only model. Why? I did not say why. I said it is the only model. So now, uh, now look at the reason. It's exactly the same as the ancient. It's the object, right? From this explanation, he, he, from this, the explanation is evident. How is it that mathematics is certain? Why arithmetic and geometry are much more certain than other disciplines? The reason is that they alone are concerned with an object so pure and simple that they suppose absolutely nothing which experience has rendered uncertain. But they consist entirely in consequences rationally deduced. So what I want to emphasize, of course there is a shift, there is something, we want to put emphasis on the inferences and so on, but still the argument is based on the object. If the object that permits that is not knowledge that permits mathematics, it's the type of object that it deals with. Now if you look in rule 4, the one in which mathematics is universal is for sure, uh, I won't go into every detail, but this is something like an autobiography. And the, what they can say is that when I was young, I learned that mathematics was the most certain of all science. This is exactly like Piccolomi. And I looked, and I was completely deceived. Mathematics is not certain at all. So this is what he says. When I first applied my mind to the mathematical disciplines, I began by reading most of those things that mathematical authors usually teach. I paid most, at most attention to arithmetic and geometry since they were said to be simplest and at the same time path to the others. But in neither case did I at that time lay my hand on others who fully satisfy me. And why? Exactly the same problem that, that with the, the problem of the certitude you know. They didn't show me why this matters to me and how they have been discovered. 
All right. So it's very close to the question of the certitude You need to give the reason for the fact and not the fact and the reason for the fact. And, and then he, 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 he explained, I won't read it, but he, you, you will read it at home. He explained that, uh, uh, that in fact, uh, mathematics of his time are, are rubbish. Are rubbish, and you, you better not do it. You better do something else because you will ruin your mind by doing this. Which is exactly what uh, Plato is saying. Geometers, they don't speak the proper way. Don't do, don't do geometry, or do it my way, but uh, we have to, to, to see what you could do. Anyway. And, and what is very surprising is that then we say, we, we, we told ourselves, that, how is it that he, he still says that mathematics are, are modern? All right. And he says, I suspected <laughs> that the ancient knew some mathematics that we lost. Okay. So it's, it's not based on evidence, it's based on a guess. It's based on exactly what we are not supposed to do. Okay, the only argument that he has is this one. There is no other argument. Right. So that's quite uh, intriguing. Uh, I will go very fast on that aspect, but the other very interesting aspect is that, in fact, Descartes will build a complete system of knowledge in which what is very important is to picture things on imagination. And he will argue that imagination is, is the subject which displays very distinctly all the proportion. And this is exactly what Proclus explained about geometry. What makes the certainty of uh, geometry is it subject matter, which is imagination, and on imagination we have a very specific kind of object on which we can see the relation, like directly, all right? So I won't go into uh, all the detail of this because I see the time is running. Now let's go to, uh, so I have many other quotes by Descartes, but uh, uh, I, I love them. Uh, no, let's now go to, uh, to Leibniz. So we talk about Leibniz this morning and we talk, about, we talk about this question of clear and distinct and so on. So Leibniz, uh, uh, thought that clear and distinct was not enough and that we should be fine and have degree in this. And, and so uh, he explained that we need to give criteria that the cognition can be clear or obscure, confused or distinct and so on. All right. So the basic idea is that something is clear when you can recognize it, like a beautiful woman, but you don't know why. But this thing when you can say why, you can give necessary and sufficient condition, but then you can give necessary and, and, and sufficient condition which are not themselves very clear. All right? So in this case, the knowledge is symbolic. That means you can give mark, clear mark of the object, you can recognize the object surely, but the, the criteria are not clear, all right? If everything that enters into the analysis is clear and distinct, so the connection will be intuitive. So that's the most perfect of all knowledge, all right? So now, let's look, so this is, he explained that in this uh, but it always goes into a distinct knowledge, on the other hand, can be distinctly known. If consequently the analysis is conducted through to one hand, then is the connection adequate? And now is the part which is in perfect agreement with what you say, nobody quote this one usually. Whether a man can offer a perfect example of this, I do not know. <coughs> Yet the knowledge of numbers comes very close to it. Not is an example of this. It's something which assembles that. Right? So this is for people who think that they need to pretend that uh, uh, arithmetical knowledge is analytic. All right? So this is not what he says. It's an example of what analytic should be. This is the best example that we have, but it's not an <laughs> And then what he explained is that because we use symbolic knowledge all the time, we don't know, we don't even have one example, clear example of a perfect analytic knowledge. And we need to produce a demonstration of the possibility of the object. And here, what survive again is the, the necessity to give causal definition, genetic definition. So that's exactly the same criterion which is in Proclus. That is to say, we have to, and this is linked to what you explained, that is to say, we have to generate the object to show their possibility. So this is very striking because we don't see a huge rupture even if on the level of the culture of that time, this was the quote with Boris de Nassau, there was a rupture. There was a huge rupture on the status of mathematics. Was huh? There was a rupture on the status of culture, uh, on the cultural background. So, uh, I have other, okay, this is a beautiful quote. I have it on, it was in French, I, I don't have a translation. Uh, uh, but just to show to you the, to which point Euclid was a conservative as regard Euclidian geometry. Les géomètres qui sont les véritables maîtres dans l'art de raisonner. So we, we are writing something like they do purely deductive this system, or I don't know what with axiom. 
ont vu que pour leur démonstration, pour que les démonstrations qu'on tire des définitions soient bonnes, il faut prouver au postulé au moins que la notion comprise dans la définition est possible. C'est pourquoi Euclid a mis parmi ses postulatins que le cercle est quelque chose de possible en demandant qu'on puisse décrire un cercle dont le centre et le rayon soient donnés. Et c'est ce qu'on a fait explain this morning. There is no virtue on that aspect, on that constructive accept, and the certainty is the, on the same kind. Exactly the same kind. It's the kind of object in which we can exhibit construction. Okay? There is the difficult part in the argument, I won't do this here, is to show that all the fuss about symbolic notation in Leibniz is in continuity with that. That is to say that for Leibniz, symboli symbols and notation are on par with diagrams. They are, they are what Peirce would call diagrams. And this is exactly what Peirce will explain later. But I won't do this here, this is not the book. Uh, so this he says in, in other... So just let me read this quote because this is a wonderful one. I, I have only in French, I will try to paraphrase it. But this is so, this is so beautiful. Sans doute la raison n'était pas mystérieuse qui explique, hein Leibniz, 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 Elementar Rationis, uh, 1686. So, sans doute la raison n'était pas mystérieuse qui explique qu'à ce jour, seules les disciplines mathématiques aient été parées jusqu'à exciter l'étonnement et la jalousie, non seulement de la certitude, mais aussi de l'abondance de vérité. So, we know perfectly well why mathematics is the most certain of all things to the point that everybody is jealous. De so why? What, what is this reason? Car le fait ne peut être attribué au génie des mathématiciens qui ne l'emportent en rien sur les autres sommes. La chose même l'enseigne chaque fois qu'ils s'aventurent euh, hors de leurs orbites. It's not linked to the genius of mathematicians. As soon as they, get, they speak about other things, like politics and so on, they say exactly the same bullshit than the other. Mais on doit l'attribuer à la nature de l'objet. Okay? This is has to be attributed to the nature of the object. Okay? où la vérité peut être exposée sous les yeux, en sorte qu'il ne subsiste aucun doute, et où d'elle-même se découvre une certaine suite, et pour ainsi dire, le fil de la pensée. We can see the, the reasoning on an object. Okay. C'est exactement ce que Proctor a dit. Et ça, c'est lié à l'imagination, je ne vais pas commenter sur ça. Il y a une belle quote dans le nouveau essai, dans lequel il dit ce qui est particulier dans les mathématiques, c'est le parallélisme entre la raison et l'expérience. This is what is specific to mathematics. All right. There is a good parallelism between. And we lose this parallelism as soon as we get rid of the objects which permit this perfect parallelism. All right, so now, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I have also, uh, this is a beautiful uh, uh, quote. I just will, uh, it, it's in Latin, I'm sorry. But uh, uh, in many places, Leibniz says that, for example, we don't know what arithmetic is. All right. We don't, be, the simple fact that we can't know how to solve Diophantine equation, he says, show you that you don't know what a number is. There are many, many passages which are not commented because there are number theory and number theory like it was not well studied. And in this, in this quote, which is from 1694, so like it is not a young guy, he says that we don't know what algebra is, we don't know what arithmetic is. So once again, what does it mean that mathematics is certain? <laughs> What does that mean? I mean, it, we don't know the object. It, it's not transparent. Okay? So I go to my conclusion. And uh, so we have a problem. We have a problem. I mean, it, 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 it seems that uh, uh, ancient mathematics did not look like this thing. But, uh, but still, there were claims that it was. So uh, I will just uh, mention a proposal that was made by <laughs> Revin Nets in his book on the shaping of deduction in Greek mathematics, which I think is very interesting for philosophers. And this is what he says, and I think it's very, uh, it's very, it's very stimulating. What unifies the scientific community need not to be a set of beliefs. Shared beliefs are much less common than shared practice. This will tend to be the case in general because shared beliefs require shared practice, but not vice versa. But this must be the case in cultural settings such as the Greek, where polemic is the rule and consensus is the exception. We saw that. Whatever is an object of belief, whatever is verbal verbalizable, will become visible to the practitioner. What you believe, you will sooner or later discuss, and what you discuss, especially in a cultural setting similar to the Greek, you will sooner or later debate. This is what exactly what we see in Proclus. Whatever you say, whatever you present as a belief, okay, you will have to discuss it. Okay, somebody can arrive with a proof and says this is not true. But the reason debated and in a sense, undebatable aspect of any scientific enterprise, it's in non-verbal practices. 
And what NETS has proposed is to interpret these non-verbal practices precisely as the way that we connect the diagram and the logic of the diagram and a very poor language and insist on that case, on, on that aspect. So we fit together language with a very poor vocabulary, very, very poor, very formula, with a functioning of the diagram, and we get the way into the which the, 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 the Greek proof works. So I don't want to, uh, to uh, we can discuss, let's, this is, that's not my point. I, I don't say, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't agree with everything that he says. But I think that there is something which is very, very striking that is reconstructing all of this, and this is exactly what we find in Proclus and in Descartes. And Leibniz. This is very interesting. And it does not say that. It does not speak about the, the evidence that we can find in Proclus about all of these debates and so on. He says that from a reconstruction of what he knows about the Greek culture and what he knows about the practice of mathematics. All right, so uh, I will uh, stop here. So uh, to com do I have like two minutes? No? No. <laughs> um, all right. Oh, so no. I, I just leave it like this. Thank, Thank you. you.